with Gabriel London. Uh, your film, The Life and Mind of Mark DeFreist. Great film. Here's a guy who is literally a genius, and out of 30 years, 27 years in solitary confinement, and has survived. Tell me how you learned about Mark and how you decided to make the documentary. It was 2001. I was working on a project with Human Rights Watch. Um, I had just graduated from college and I was doing research on different prisoners' stories for this project. And I was in contact with a woman who ran an organization. It was called Stop Prison Rape. It's now called Just Detention International. And I was interested in, in finding out about actually another individual, a guy named uh, Stephen Donaldson, who had passed away from AIDS that he contracted in prison. Uh, heavy stuff, really heavy stuff. And at the moment uh, that I was t about to talk to her, I found this article called Locked Alone on X-Wing. And it told the story of the worst prison tier in all of Florida State Prison, in all of Florida, where there were the two floors above the electric chair. And they held the people there that were the most incorrigible. And they mentioned all these different bios of different people, people who killed guards, people who had uh, uh, killed police officers, rapists, murderers, the whole thing. And then one guy who had never physically harmed another individual who was a renowned escape artist, Mark DeFriest. And what was amazing was it had nothing to do with what I was researching for this project for Human Rights Watch. And the next day, I talked to this woman, Judith Jones, also known as J.D. Rabbit, and she told me that she had 15 years of letters from Mark. And she sent me those letters, and I realized I had two sides of a story. I had the one side, which was this notorious prison escape artist on X-Wing, and then the other side, I had this very intimate knowledge of the suffering that he'd gone through that was recorded in letters. And, and that basically was the impetus of uh, following the story and getting the documentary done? Or was it a, a momentary interest? And then as you learn more, you know, the uh, desire grew. It's an interesting question. Um, I absolutely would say that as I learned more, it, it, I was compelled to move forward. At the same time, when I first read the letters, I knew that I was holding on to something that was just absolutely valuable. You know, it, valuable in so many senses. You know, um, valuable in, this, in, in, in the sense that it was a tract that recorded human misery, but also, again, what you said, the triumph of this person in solitary confinement. They were manic letters. They were incredible and vibrant, very live telling. I had been in correspondence with a lot of different prisoners for this project I was doing with Human Rights Watch. And many of them took me back through their history. And they wanted me to understand, you know, how they'd gotten there. And there was a lot of mm, violin playing, you know what I mean? And Mark was the opposite. His letters were totally present. He would timestamp them to the second. You know, he's a manic mind, so he would do, you know, 9.47, 47 a.m., you know, listening to this, you know, Guns N' Roses, you know, and then the next, you know, Hotel California, 1979 or 1977, the best year of my miserable life. You know what I mean? It was just like so alive, and I just knew that I had to develop the project. And then, yes, as I learned more, I just said, wow, there's a lot to this story. Because you have, you use animation. Use uh, the timestamps. Uh, there's a scene in there where you see him listening to the music. Hey, I just had coffee. And uh, how'd you get all that stuff? But besides all that, he talked about the little Walkman that he created. He goes, "I, I created the Butt Man for," <laughs> which was a small little uh, radio. Which is, again, how fascinating his mind is. How brilliant he is. You know, when you were you know going through that, what were you thinking? Man, this guy's a, a genius. Or you know, what went through your mind when you uh, you know got to that point to see how he he did these things? Yeah, I absolutely was com you know just fascinated by the fact that he could do all of these things. I am uh, a good observer. You know, I have an artistic sensibility. I don't have a particular mechanical acumen. You know, I'm not somebody who is a gearhead in any way, shape, or form. Even the people that shoot, you know, with me, the the DPs that I work with, they all care about cameras and gear and all this. And I'm, you know, very focused on, you know, composition, you know, and story. And and it's just funny when you meet somebody and you realize that your destinies are tied together in some way. I mean, I really do feel like 13 years working with Mark DeFries to help get this story out there, to tell his story. 
and you would think we would be in some way twins or something, but we're not. You know, he he had this mechanical um, ability, this genius level. Uh, He's a savant, you know, from a very early age. He was able to do many things with um, electricity and, and with machines and was known for being able to rewire the house and play, you know, his sister's phone conversations on a loudspeaker on the street. You know, like little things that m people remember as mischief. And what's interesting is when you, when you put somebody like that who's mischievous, who's super intelligent in prison and they feel unjustly put there, um, there's going to be some some issues. And yes, he was able to not only make those keys, but when they built him a custom cell above the electric chair that really was inescapable, he was in a place that had no TVs, no radios, no books, no magazines, no newspapers. There was zero stimulation. This is, and, and mind you, he was also not allowed to go out even for the one hour a week on the yard because he was on something called close management one which is basically, you're a problem, we don't want to deal with you, we're just going to leave you here forever. And he made a radio because the guys on death row, when they would be executed, 43 people died beneath him in the cell. He would smell them. He would smell burning flesh coming through into his cell, into this closed box with no windows. And these guys, the porters, the, the inmate porters, would come by after the guys were executed, or even maybe in the days just before and they would slide in through his food slot, a Walkman, you know, like a, because those guys on death row, unlike the guys on X-Wing, were allowed to have a radio. And Mark found a way to take a one-sided circuit board from inside of a Walkman and solder um, the circuits onto two sides, add, as he said, a graphic equalizer and whatever else he needed to really pump it up, and then melt the plastic and resheath it, and yes, that is how he took the Walkman and made it into the Buttman. <laughs> Just to know that he did it with nothing, it, like a, a MacGyver from back in the day, that just really took what he had. You know, it, it's amazing. You know, <laughs> conspiracy theory here. You, know, you, you look at someone who can do that and who is brilliant because when you interview him, he's coherent. He speaks. Um, Logically, he does say a few things here and there, but you know, not surprising being confined for 27 years. Do you think that someone somewhere along the line said, you know, he's a menace to society, he can topple, you know, part of the system with his brilliant mind? Let's keep him. I know I'm really pushing that out there, but you know, I'm trying to get grips of a guy who hasn't hurt anyone, who's been locked up, not even a danger to himself but he's been in confinement for 27 years. You know, any, any theories, even far-fetched on your, you know, on your part? My only theory is that he humiliated people to a point where they felt like they're just done with him and they've buried him. And the issue with storytelling and with bringing a story to the light is that now he's no longer buried. And now they have to acknowledge uh, really in its entirety, his character, um, his past, uh, his present. And they have not done that thus far. They have very much been operating under the, the, the premise that he is infamous and he is doomed. And I, I don't think that his crimes, and we have people from the Parole Commission in Florida who say very clearly his crimes are not the type of crimes that you would leave somebody in prison for uh, all these years. And it's his behavior. Well, his behavior has turned a corner. And, you know, this idea that we have to preemptively hold people in prison or preemptively, you know, strike other people before they hit us, that is a hallmark of paranoia on the part of the society. The society should know from looking at his record uh, that he has not had a history of violent acting out, even when provoked, that he has a very defined moral code. And that in this case, it is not a good, you don't, you don't hold people in prison preemptively, you know. You, you can't even keep people in mental hospitals preemptively anymore, you know. The, people have to be a danger to themselves or to others. So the idea that there's a, there's a, a big loophole that allows us to keep hundreds of thousands of people with, you know, questionable mental backgrounds in, in prison is just uh, outrageous without, without real cause, you know, without them having specifically committed any crimes, but really because you're 
concern that they can't have a perfect disciplinary record. Well, if you have mental illness, you have symptoms. You know, you have specific symptoms, manic outbursts, that kind of thing, that may cause you to say things out of turn. You know, but these aren't the kind of things that we imprison people for. At least I don't think so. Yeah. Right. Well, we shouldn't, right? <laughs> Who never knows the cracks? Um, I think people fall through the crack. But you, you brought up the, uh, the parole board, which is fascinating, because you have that in there at the end of the movie, and you have we are one of the um, panels actually speaking. And he says, well, you know, eh, his behavior, and he goes on and on, eh, we'll extend it another 12 months. And, you know, throughout the film you're trying to establish, look, there, are, there is a case that he's not um, mentally uh, sound completely. You know, there have things that have altered him. Yet, here's a panel who had a chance to take that into consideration, but they didn't. You know, you know, from from your viewpoint, when you saw that, you were thinking, they just don't believe, uh, believe he's changed. You know, you know, wh what do you think about that? I was shocked that there was, a, and uh, I was shocked that there was any disagreement that he had changed. Um, I've known him now for 13 years, and. Um, I've seen what this little bit of light has meant to him and how he has turned a corner as far as somebody who had been completely without hope for so many years, who literally just never believed that he was going to see the light of day again. And then actually realized that there was this possibility and that there was this political process, ostensibly, that could work, where human compassion, uh, reason, uh, and, and, and wisdom could be brought to bear on his situation. And, and those three traits are something that all parole boards should be imbued with. You know, that they are not looking, they are not computers. They are not looking at binary code and trying to figure out I inputs and outputs and whether, yeah, you know, yes he did good, no he did bad. It is more complicated than that. And there are absolutely mitigating circumstances that have to be considered when you're looking at somebody's case. And even so, Mark gave them, has given them for these number of years, an almost perfect record. And he has been recognized by the prison system. And he has gone from a level six solitary confinement inmate to a level three inmate with a job who's taking computer classes, who's doing so much better. So on all of the marks that we gen generally judge people by, whether it's um, just this binary kind of, are you doing good or are you doing bad? Or the actual, I have compassion, I understand your situation, I understand that there are other things I need to consider. Under both considerations, he's hitting the mark. And the question really is, moving forward, he has another hearing August 20th. Where are we going to find the Parole Commission this time? Fantastic. Fantastic. And just uh, a couple last questions. Uh, what would you like the, uh, the audience to walk away with from the, with the film? You know, here's a guy, you know, have compassion, you know, who, who's been locked up. You know, what would you like them to walk away with? Make sure this doesn't happen again? I want r people to really walk away with a sense that they've gotten to know Mark DeVriest. I want them to feel like they have not seen a filmmaker sort of pouring pity on a man, but rather that this man has actually had a chance to voice his story, and the people around him have had a chance to have their stories told. And it's important to me that the filmmaking be a platform as opposed to a kind of a political um, g g grand gesture. And I think what was most important for me was that people would be able to laugh with Mark. He's a funny guy. It wasn't most important to me that people would come out raising the flag, you know, on his behalf, although I think there's some of that that comes out. But I think that when I hear audiences laughing with him, understanding that he's survived all those years in solitary confinement with a sense of humor and a sense of humanity, that matters. Amazing. Gabriel, thank you for taking the time and a beautiful story. Thank you. My pleasure.